Hi, my name is George Galt. I'm Associate General Counsel at the Associated Press, and I uh, work in the transactions area. I um, do all the, uh, or much of the licensing for AP uh, and the legal work associated with that. And for many years, uh, I've been uh, worried about the efficiency of, of our licensing models and how we can properly address uh, difficulties with licensing. And uh, a few years ago, I fortunately ran into Stuart, who started talking about rights expression languages and got me very interested in the topic and uh, brought me here today. Um, from our perspective, there are a handful of business cases really for rights expression languages. Uh, you can obviously, um, I think from a news agency perspective, uh, one very important thing is obviously the ability to communicate specific rights related to specific uh, items, whether those are uh, uh, photograph or video uh, or audio items or, or text, um, so that clients who already have an established relationship with us can easily incorporate that information into the workflows and uh, have uh, more efficiency in processing our content. I think one of the, the biggest problems that um, clients of AP or any other news agency face is that with reducing staffs and, uh, and the reduction generally in, in news budgets, um, much of the way we have handled specific uh, item restrictions, for example, a, a uh, online out on a, on a particular uh, photograph or a uh, no use for magazines or something of that nature, uh, has always been text information associated with that photograph that has to be processed manually by an individual. They have to notice it. They have to take actions upon it. If they miss it or if it somehow doesn't get properly communicated, that creates a very large problem in the workflow. And so rights expression languages can help significantly there by automating that process. Um, the other one I think that has been talked about already here today is, is communicating the restrictions to the general public um, about the content that you're placing in a public sphere. So establishing uh, a means by which people who see your content online can understand the rights or responsibilities or restrictions associated with that content in an easily accessible fashion is important to organizations like AP, uh, especially for somebody like AP who doesn't have a real presence itself on the internet uh, and relies on our clients primarily to be publishing our content. We often find it's difficult to necessarily have a equal set of rights established across websites. It's very difficult to have uh, one particular newspaper's website uh, rights line up with another newspaper's website's rights and, and have an equal footing for everyone uh, for the content, for the same content that's being pre presented on both sites. Um, but the one I really want to talk a little bit about today really is the last one, which is um, to form the basis for, for an automated transaction process. Uh, that is finding a way to um, make the process of licensing content more efficient for uh, entities like AP and our, our customers. So what is the problem? Um, generally, this is how the sales process works. Uh, AP shows up at a doorway, rings the doorbell, and, and tries to engage somebody in the sales process. We have to go to a lot of different doors to find someone who actually wants to purchase the content. But eventually we get there and we find someone who wants to engage in that uh, process. The business people get together, they have a conversation, they talk about how to, uh, you know, what kind of rights they want to exchange, what kind of content, how they want feeds made. And the conversation goes back and forth and back and forth until finally they come to some sort of business case that they then present to people like me, the lawyers. Uh, and I get together with lawyers for the other organization and we start to talk and talk and talk some more and often we send questions back to the business people who then end up talking some more, uh, who then send the answers back to us and we talk some more and the process goes on and on and on uh, for quite some time, sometimes. I, I actually, uh, just as a, a little aside, I remember uh, ending and signing a contract with a large news organization, um, we signed the contract six months after it expired. It was a three-year deal, and it took us three and a half years to close it. <coughs> um, but eventually, you do get to a deal. Uh, 
that, uh, that everyone's happy with, and we sign it, and that's how we make our money. So this is a very inefficient process. Um, it makes sense in the context of a large news organization like AP working with another l large news organization like the BBC or CNN or the New York Times or some of that nature where we want to be able to have a very specific set of, of rights and restrictions communicated. They want to acquire a very specific set of rights and a very specific content set and both organizations are willing to invest the effort in this rather complicated process to make sure that that all works properly. So what can we do about it? Um, I'll get the first one out of the way because that's the one everyone always wants. Um, even if you did that, uh, that only takes care of a little tiny piece of that last problem. Um, and personally, I think it wouldn't be particularly effective. Um, my personal favorite. Um, <coughs> Uh, but again, that doesn't really solve the problem. Um, and so where, where do you really want to go? You want to go to an automated transaction process. If this isn't going to be um, a transaction between two large news organizations, then you really do have to have something that is far more efficient than the process I just outlined. Um, and you know, it needs to be established in a way that is, is easily communicated and is maintained across multiple platforms. So, you know, what do we mean by this? This is the, the problem that we have that we don't want, and this is what we want to get to. The process by which com computers, our computers, computers at the, at the client sites can communicate efficiently and effectively to get the content that those entities need and the, um, communicate the rights and other aspects of, of the contract properly. So what do we need in order to be able to do this? Um, there are a handful of pieces, only one of which really is the rights expression language uh, piece. There's obviously a need for, um, for the clients to be able to determine what they want. Uh, and generally that's resolved through metadata and metadata search. Um, AP has systems for doing that. I know Reuters has Open Calais. There are other systems out there that allow content to be tagged with metadata that makes it easily uh, searchable and um, allows entities to acquire that content uh, easily. Um, we need a means for everybody to negotiate price and determine um, and usage. And that's really where the rights expression language piece of this comes into play, is communicating those rights and communicating the, the monetization process so that we can uh, have an effective agreement and, and move forward. Um, means for determining usage, uh, I think there, there are several things that are out there that can do this. Uh, uh, there's uh, AP developed an organization called uh, NewsRight um, that handles this kind of activity. There's a tributor. There are a handful of other organizations out there that can help track content usage and report that usage in a, uh, in a way that, that allows to, to take out of the equation the possibility for, um, uh, shall we say, misreporting what your usage looks like and perhaps underpaying. So what do we need when it comes to rights expression language? Uh, there are lots of things as a lawyer that I would like in a rights expression language. Um, I'm probably actually going to list many of them, possibly not all of them. Um, but these are things that are really essential. If you're talking about that last bit of the process where you have a, uh, where you have a, a, a situation in which you have a small client, a website, a blogger, somebody like that who wants to acquire content and needs to understand precisely what they're getting and you have a large news organization that is attempting to serve those small clients efficiently uh, but still protect its rights. So the things that we normally look for when expressing rights are um, these kinds of, of elements. We're going to want to be able to specify very, very clearly both the platform for distribution and the media type of distribution. So we're going to want to be able to say things like uh, audio distribution via website or video distribution via mobile applications or uh, you know, uh, photographs distributed online in a gallery format. Um, you need to be able to have that kind of specificity to be able to develop the licenses that would really work in 
this context for news organizations like AP. Um, we need to be able to also specify the scope of use, whether it is a, you know, you're required to use the, the text in a verbatim fashion, whether you can create snippets of it, whether you can utilize that text uh, to create a derivative work, in other words, uh, take an AP story about a news event and utilizing your own reporting, add to that and create a, a full story that uh, includes your own reporting. Uh, obviously, territory restrictions, um, AP and many other worldwide news organizations limit their licenses via territory uh, so that we can properly monetize the content. Um, and then there's obviously language and translation rights. Um, and actually, just one thing that I didn't put up here, but uh, one thing that we are starting to run into is um, the issue of machine translation. Uh, some people um, have been asking us for the right to be able to translate our stories via uh, computer-derived uh, translations. Uh, it's something that we have actually w worked with. Uh, the problem there is that those translations can be sometimes not very good, uh, and we have to find that's something that we need to be very careful of, and would want to be able to, to examine uh, in this kind of a, a rights expression language. Other things that we're going to also want to talk about, obviously, are ex exclusivity or probably more accurately, non-exclusivity. Um, and the rights that we retain, such as, uh, you know, we're not, we give you a, a photograph that you, you can distribute in certain places or in certain ways, but you can't distribute it in others. Um, the one thing I do also want to emphasize is that, uh, is that bullet point that says, um, we need the ability to express a general withholding. Generally, you'll see this in almost every contract where a lawyer will say, uh, all rights not granted herein are retained by the, the content holder. Uh, and it's a lawyer's means of protecting themselves from what are called implied licenses. Uh, implied licenses are, are very, um, very much in vogue with a lot of people who uh, want to say that uh, distribution via certain means uh, implies uh, a broad set of rights uh, in that content. Um, uh, lawyers tend to not like that particular approach to things. So we like in, in the form of a rights expression language to be able to say that. And it's very important to do that because some courts might actually start to imply some of those licenses if we don't have those kinds of withholding clauses. Then we get to the, uh, the really important stuff, how do we get paid? Um, there are a number of different business models. Um, but they sort of fall into a handful of, of buckets, primarily things like a straight cash payment, um, you know, per user metric or per page view or other kind of display metric. Um, those things are important for us because obviously we license uh, our content in a way that is intended to maximize our ability to monetize that content. And we want to uh, have some flexibility in how we do that. Obviously for clients it's important because they too want to ensure that they're paying what they view as an appropriate amount for the content and only by having a variety of flexible means for measuring those content usages can you actually end up with a negotiated solution that both parties are happy with. The other thing that we need to be able to express uh, is some of the functional obligations that we're going to be placing on those clients. Um, things like copyright notices or links to privacy policies or terms of usage. These are very important because uh, often when we are distributing our content, we have certain things that go along with it. Um, the original uh, model that was uh, put forward with Newsrite was that they were, um, the content would go out with something called a news usage tag on it, which was basically a web beacon. And when an end user viewed a story, that would trigger a count somewhere. Um, that has all sorts of privacy implications, and if you are going to properly establish that kind of a structure, the end user who is clicking on that content needs to know that there is a, a tracking mechanism going on with that. In order to do that, you have to be able to specify to the website that's taking the content what their obligations are to report your privacy policy so that they can properly fulfill the requirements of the laws in the various countries where, this, uh, where, they're, where the content is being displayed. Um, obviously, other things like uh, audit rights and all those things are going to be important for us to be able to express as well because at the end of the day, we want to get paid, we want to know how much you've used and whether or not uh, um, you've properly reported those metrics. Uh, and then all the lawyer favorite stuff, boilerplate, things like choice of law and jurisdiction. Uh, I know 
Thomas Hoffner and I are going to be talking a little bit later about issues related to uh, worldwide rights and how those, those rights uh, um, are affected in various territories. Uh, the easiest thing for me as a lawyer um, is to specify what choice of law I'm going to have applied to the contract because then I know for certain how things are going to work out. Um, similarly, jurisdiction clauses are helpful because you can then specify the courts that are going to be applying that law. But I just wanted to, and I just wanted to sort of tie this thing up with one final overall thought. Um, in talking with a lot of people about rights expression languages, uh, and even just in the presentation I've done myself here, there are a lot of moving pieces. Um, and you can very easily get lost in all the variables and all the details. Um, the one thing I would try and, and ask IPTC is to remember that it doesn't have to do it all. The large organizations, the large news organizations, we're always going to go back for that inefficient model or apparently inefficient model because actually in that context it's the best way to do it. In those other negotiations, those places where we can't currently sell our content because the purchaser is too small uh, to engage in that process uh, or the, the volume is just too small, those are only a handful of situations and so you don't need to be able to go too far uh, into too many variables to be able to satisfy most of those clients. And it would be better to move forward with a rights expression language that handled 80% of the problem than wait for it to handle 100% of the problem. Uh, and so I would just encourage uh, IPTC to think about the fact that it's best that at least starting out um, to not try and do it all at one time. And that is it. Thank you.